good good afternoon folks it's great to be back again um and i'm i'm rajiv managing partner at orias venture partners um we are an early stage venture capital fund with close to 100 startups and a few unicorns um introducing today's topic this year has been an interesting ride it got recently topped off with the silicon valley bank kerfuffle the uncertainty and volatility has just been sky high uh, for the last six months at least, and the world has sort of been foreseeing a crisis that has been imminent for the last three or four months. That's one of the reasons why today's speaker, Dan, is such an interesting guru to speak to. I'm really excited to be talking to him. Dan is the founder, Dan Rasmussen, is the founder and CEO of Verdad Advisors, a global asset management firm he founded with the thesis to replicate the private market equity success in public markets. He created a framework for crisis investing, which he used with great success during the 2020 March COVID uh, you know, crisis, and uh, he made a ton of money. Um, and before starting with that, uh, Dan worked with Bain Capital and Bridgewater, uh, very blue chip names. Dan is a contributor to Wall Street Journal, and his investment research has been featured in multiple volumes of the best investment um, you know, uh, writing. He's also the author of uh, New York-based bestseller, um, American Uprising, The Untold Story of America's Largest Slave Revolt that happened in New Orleans in 1811. Um, clearly, history is a topic that's favorite for you, Dan. Uh, a multi-talented intellect with a deep penchant for storytelling. Um, all very great points um, that point to a great conversation today. I'm really looking forward to this. So I'm going to let Dan take the center stage for about 30 minutes. Um, you know, uh, so he will have a few uh, you know, sort of slides to present. Folks, you don't need to make any notes because we are very happy to make this conversation available after. After this, we'll move to the Q&A. Please do type in your questions in the chat and we'll definitely get to them. Um, I'll ask and moderate the questions. I look forward to a productive um, one hour or so. So Dan, without further ado, over to you. Thank you so much, Rajiv. It's nice to be here and nice to uh, meet you all. I'm gonna share my screen here. Perfect. So I'm just going to start out with an introduction to Verdad. Uh, we are a quantum mental uh, investment firm. We manage a little over $800 million. Um, Rajiv mentioned my interest in history, uh, and we apply that to markets. We study very long data sets of market history, uh, and we use the latest econometric techniques to understand what has historically driven markets and what are the predictive variables that matter. Uh, but we don't rely on data alone. Uh, everything we test, every relationship we study, and every predictive model uh, we build is founded in logic. We're trying to marry, you know, I think to predict the future, to understand the world, uh, you want to have a logical framework uh, that makes sense. Um, and then you want that logical framework to be supported by the best data uh, and statistics available. And that's our approach. Um, the following slides are our macro synthesis. So what we think is going on in the world. Uh, we study cross assets. We look at stocks, bonds, and commodities. Uh, we've studied a huge range of signals uh, to try to discern what are the things that really help you understand and make decisions on a go-forward basis. Uh, most of these signals are relatively short-term signals. They're you know one month uh, uh, forward view, um, but they're helpful for giving us a sense of where we are in markets and what's going on. Uh, we've been studying uh, these broad questions uh, for about seven years. Uh, we write a weekly research piece um, uh, you can sign up for if you go to my Twitter at VerdadCap. There's a link in my bio to the sign up. We write every Monday morning. Uh, we, 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 we've been studying, I think, the topic. We started by looking at crises, how to think about crises, how to invest in a crisis, and I'll get to that at the end. Um, and then we looked at emerging markets and how to invest in crises in emerging markets. Uh, and our most recent work is focused on counter-cyclical investing. So how do you um, attempt to uh, do well when you're entering a crisis as well as when you're in one. Um, uh, and perhaps we're entering a crisis now, so that's a, a fruitful uh, a fruitful topic. So what's moving markets? Silicon Bank, uh, Sil Silicon Valley Bank failure is, is obviously the biggest thing moving markets right now. Um, we uh, have done a lot of work on a concept called the financial accelerator, which is a term that was coined by Ben Bernanke. Uh, and the financial accelerator, the idea of the financial accelerator is um, uh, Bernanke was asking the question of why do small shocks like to lead to big crises? Uh, and what he found or what he argued is that 
a small shock leads to a big crisis because of the financial system. So when a shock happens, uh, lenders um, reevaluate um, their risk tolerance. And when they reevaluate their risk tolerance, they typically will raise borrowing rates or reduce their amount of lending. Uh, and when lending gets reduced economy-wide, uh, it has very pernicious impacts on the economy. Um, uh, new investment slows, M&A slows, um, uh, projects that were going to get funded don't get funded. Um, and so basically this financial uh, accelerator is the process by which um, the lending system uh, slows or shuts and thus really is what creates crises in our credit-driven world. Um, we monitor, and the best way to look or, or understand the financial accelerator in, in, in real time is a metric called the high yield spread. So the, the high yield spread is the best way to think about the financial accelerator. Uh, and it measures the difference in the borrowing costs between high yield borrowers and treasuries. Uh, when high yield, high yield is the riskiest portion of the, uh, uh, of the uh, corporate bond market, right? So typically smaller companies, riskier companies. And when that spread rises, which can happen as a result of two things, one is the cost of borrowing for high yield issuers going up, and one is treasury rates going down, and both those typically happen in a crisis, uh, you can really understand how banks are thinking about pricing risk. And so Silicon Valley Bank is a really important thing because it's a bank, um, and all the other banks are looking at that bank and making decisions based on it. And so Silicon Valley Bank failure um, sent high yield spreads on a huge upward move. Um, and that's typically a very bearish thing. And so I'm gonna get into that a little bit more later, but, uh, but that's by far the biggest thing going on in markets. Um, as a result, you know, momentum is really important. We, we, we do cover um, and, and observe uh, trends in markets um, and those matter quite a bit. So we'll talk about how, how we're seeing trends in markets, but broadly uh, momentum has been positive for fixed income, especially treasuries and negative for equities and commodities. The momentum we've seen in, in markets has been uh, quite bearish. So it's been positive for fixed income and, and negative for equities and, and commodities. Uh, we've also seen the stock bond correlation, um, which is a really important indicator. Um, you know, most people hold some mix of stocks and bonds. And in 2022, uh, we saw a huge move in stock bond correlations where stock and bonds, which we would like to be negatively correlated, um, became very positively correlated in 2022. And when stocks went down, um, uh, bonds went down. When stocks went up, bonds went up because the entire market was trading on interest rates. Uh, and what we've seen this year is that that hasn't been the case. The stock bond correlation has been dropping, uh, which is ultimately good for fixed income, but uh, uh, not necessarily as good for um, uh, commodities. Uh, and finally, we've seen continued inflationary pressures. And that's a sort of cross-cutting um, the broad story that we're seeing from high yield spread, momentum, and stock bond correlations is a simple one, which is, you know, uh, commodities and equities down and fixed income up. Um, uh, uh, but the problem is that inflation uh, is uh, stubbornly high, uh, and inflation uh, can really uh, have a negative impact on fixed income. And so the positive signs that we're seeing, not, not positive, but clear signals we're seeing from those other macro variables are not necessarily supported by what we're seeing with inflation. And that remains a risk to markets, right? If the Fed, um, uh, if the Fed uh, uh, is not able to contain inflation, then bonds, which are otherwise our best safe haven and the thing that's working in today's market um, could also come under increasing pressure. And that's really why it's a very risky and, and tricky time in the market. A lot of talk about what's going to happen with the Federal Reserve, um, and I think a lot of people trying to front run changes in the Federal Reserve. Um, we follow the high yield spread as our, our primary variable, and what we found is that uh, in previous hiking events, um, what you saw is that the high yield spread didn't peak until after the Fed stopped hiking. So, and, and when high yield spreads peak, that's bad, right? That's typically when equities are at their worst. And so I think the people who are trying to front run uh, any changes in the Fed uh, are probably missing that the worst market outcomes come after the Fed has stopped hiking, right? The Fed only stops hiking when they see enough economic pain or enough reduction in inflation, but usually enough economic pain, they can't do it anymore. Uh, and I think that's another reason that Silicon Valley Bank is so important. Um, because it's given the Fed a real insight into the negative consequences of raising rates so fast um, that some of these banks really got cut off sides. Uh, and so I think what we're 
you know, the, the risk if this follows the classic recessionary pattern uh, is that the Fed stops raising rates sometime in the next uh, few months. And then after that, equity markets bottom. That would be the typical pattern, whether that'll happen this time or not. Uh, we're not sure, but that's what we've seen historically. Mm -hmm. The high yield spread, which again is our, we consider the best macroeconomic indicator. Um, what you can see is that when spreads rise above about 450 basis points, uh, risk and reward in the market becomes, uh, asymmetry becomes a significant. Every 30% plus drawdown in the markets has occurred within six months of credit spreads crossing 450. Uh, and credit spreads were below 450 prior to Silicon Valley Bank, and they're almost at 500 today. So we're back in this um, real danger zone uh, where we need to be very worried about equity market risk. And we're going to see that come up um, again and again in the following slides. But I think the key uh, thing to consider here, right, is that the financial accelerator risk here, the risk that lending gets reduced, that credit gets cut off, um, is very significant at these levels of spread um, and the negative impacts that can have on equities and other uh, uh, markets and even on GDP growth are, are quite significant. So I'm going to go to walk through in detail what we see in um, these uh, key indicators that we track. So we, we focus on these four key signals that we think are what really matters most to markets. Um, the most predictive is high yield spread. Um, as high yield spreads rise, that's bad for equity markets and uh, commodities. When spreads fall, it's generally good. Um, but basically saying that when lending is freely available, it's better. And when lending gets constricted, it's risky. Uh, momentum is important. So it's very good to know, you know what's been happening recently and understand that because things do trend. Stock bond correlation I've discussed and inflation is obviously quite important. Um, but the predictive power uh, is uh, ranked on that screen. So the most important being being the high yield spread. So here's here's the um, high yield spread over time. This is just the change in high yield spread, and you can see that the spread spikes at times of uh, of real risk or uncertainty. Uh, and you can see, you know, this most recent period. Just this is basically still that one up dramatic upward red line is um, is Silicon Valley Bank failing. And that's a, a one standard deviation move, which is really, really significant. Um, and usually that um, drives a, a, you know, a, a flight to safety and to treasuries and people pulling money out of small cap stocks, often emerging market stocks uh, and, and commodities like oil. Right, and we can see that move has been confirmed by looking at recent momentum, right? You can see fixed income um, is uh, you know, one, one or almost two standard deviations. Uh, positive in terms of momentum, right? So people really are rushing into safe haven assets as a result of Silicon Valley Bank failure. Uh, and we can see that for equities and commodities, it's been a negative, which is what you'd expect. And here you can see the stock bond correlation. And you can see that in 2022, we had this big move um, uh, where the stock bond uh, correlation was going up which is bad, right? Because you're, if you own stocks and bonds, you want the diversification benefits. And so um, uh, when stocks and bond correlation goes up, it's, it's really bad for fixed income um, uh, because then why do you own it, right? It's a lower return and now it's correlated with equities. You're going to get out. That's what people did. And you had one of the worst years, I think the worst year for fixed income ever on record. Um, and now what you've seen is that since uh, the end of last year, a, a really big drop in that stock bond correlation. Uh, and that means that inflation is coming down. So in some sense, this is tracking inflation concerns. Um, and it's also very positive for fixed income, which can now uh, regain its ability to act as a safe haven asset. Finally, we, we have inflation. Um, this is trailing month over month inflation. Uh, what you can see is those huge, first of all, inflation is volatile, right? You can see these big spikes, um, big drops, um, uh, but broadly, what, the story of 2022 was, was very high inflation relative to history. Um, and that uh, rewarded um, oil and punished fixed income equity and equities. Um, and we're still seeing inflation relatively high. Uh, and that's a worry because I think the simple story that we've told over the previous slides of, you know, equities and commodities down and bonds up, um, if inflation comes back, you know, that's going to hurt bonds again. Um, and so part of this is just saying, hey, gee, sort of similar to last year, um, this is a very risky environment where um, even safe havens aren't necessarily safe. Um, and that's one of the problems of inflation uh, that can really bedevil markets 
So this is basically a combined view of what we're seeing in, in markets and, and where we think um, we're allocating capital based on what we're seeing. Um, the, the, the most positive is on treasuries, right? I think safe haven assets are what's working right now. Um, and if the pressure uh, market stress from Silicon Valley Bank continues, that's going to continue to be where people put cash. Um, lar we, large quality stocks are, are neutral. So another place that we think of as a relative safe haven is really big companies, big multinationals, uh, you know, big consumer staples companies that are uh, robust and profitable. Those are relatively safe. Um, but where we're seeing, I think, really quite negative momentum is in um, small cap stocks, uh, gold, oil. Um, and I think we didn't put emerging market stocks on here, but they tend to trade like small cap stocks. So um, it's, it's a very risky time, uh, we think. So I think the, the, the key points that we'd, we'd make from looking at our uh, key macro uh, dashboards would be that there's high uh, macro uncertainty. Um, generally, the key signals that we track that have predictive power um, are showing some really big moves in reaction to Silicon Valley Bank, especially the high yield spread, which is blowing out above one standard deviation, really a concerning, a concerning signal. Um, and that pushes us to recommend, at least right now, a much more defensive portfolio positioning. Uh, and that's confirmed by momentum and, and decreasing stock bond correlations. So if all of this plays out, uh, what comes next and what we... Um, what we uh, specialize in is, is actual crises. So we look at and consider a, a real crisis when high yield spreads go above 600 basis points. So they're about 500 today, about 400 is average. Uh, and when they go above 600, which they do every three to five years, we consider that to be a crisis. Uh, and we've developed an approach to investing during those crises. Um, and our approach to investing during those crises is to say, you know, when spreads hit 600, um, which again, they happen every three to five years. The last time they did is during COVID. Um, uh, we can isolate those times um, and study them and say, okay, generally, what do you want to do uh, when we're in those uh, types of market environments? Um, and just as the uh, positioning that we're talking about going into this crisis or in response to what we're seeing in the market has been very defensive, uh, you sort of want to do the opposite when there's a, uh, when you know you're in a crisis. Um, and I think that. Um, what are the things that really work in a crisis? Um, when, if you have the money, if you have cash, you're able to buy. Um, within stocks, um, the best things are the smallest, uh, least liquid and cheapest things um, that are not going bankrupt. Um, and if you can build portfolios of, uh, you know, these are often considered junk stocks. They're, they're you know, but, but they're not junk, right? They're, they're just small or liquid. People don't know about them. I think a lot of things in emerging markets would meet this type of criteria. Um, but again, that are not going bankrupt. They're profitable. They generate cash. Um, but you know, if you think about the middle of uh, March 2020, when everybody was panicking because of COVID, um, there's always a buyer for Microsoft, right? So Microsoft never gets that crazily dislocated. But a small company with you know a few hundred million dollars of uh, market capitalization, there can just be no buyers on a given day, and someone wants to get out, and it just blows out 15, down 20, down 30, on no news just because there's one seller. Uh, and if you can go and scoop up those types of things in public markets, uh, you can really, really do well. Um, the other thing that tends to work really well coming out of crises is oil. So oil is a real barometer of economic growth that tends to crash when markets crash, and it tends to recover when markets recover. Uh, and that's another good thing to uh, keep an eye at and uh, keep an eye on in times of crisis. So I think, you know, sitting here, I'd say, you know, we were very worried from uh, through the middle of last year through the end of last year about an imminent recession. Um, all the economic data in January looked very positive. And so we said, gee, you know, maybe we have this temporary period where things are fine. Um, and then I think all of a sudden uh, Silicon Valley Bank failure hit with a bang. And we saw that the Fed's rate hikes were not without consequences, that um, yes, it seems like they've been able to bring down inflation. Yes, it looks like in January, maybe that economic data was holding up really well. And so perhaps we we're going to have a soft landing. Um, and what Silicon Valley Bank showed us is that, you know, gee, this huge, huge movement in, uh, in, in, in rates um, uh, coming after a decade of zero interest rates, 
um, was going to unsettle things in surprising ways. And I think that we're in a period where people are reassessing that risk. And so I do think we're, we're on the precipice of something uh, quite worrying. And uh, I think we are in our portfolios are extremely defensive, um, but with an avaricious eye to saying, gee, if things really do blow up, uh, we want to be prepared to uh, to go in and buy the things that have been most dislocated by the crisis. So um, that's uh, that's all for my um, uh, presentation, Rajiv, and I'm, I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, you know, I think um, very insightful points there. Uh, well, let me start off with one question, though. So we have spoken about the impending crisis and how to watch out for that from the indicators that we have spoken about. But perhaps you would like to share some light on what the aftermath of a crisis is, because it's obviously the time that the opportunities for the greatest returns exist, as you have articulated in multiple conversations that you've had in the past before. So perhaps you would want to talk about why a crisis is well, you know, it's it's like a silver lining in the cloud, as it were. But why is it good for investment? If you could sort of, you know, you know, sort of uh, expound a little bit more on that. Yeah, sure. So, you know, mark markets and especially equity markets um, are um, uh, much more volatile than underlying economic growth. This is uh, what Robert Schiller won the uh, Nobel Prize in Economics for discovering, and the reason that markets are much more volatile than underlying economic growth. Um, it, and the underlying economic realities of companies is because markets are anticipating the future, right? They're pricing a net present value future cash flows and they're extrapolating that back to the present. And so when a big event happens, you know, people reevaluate their predictions. Um, and when crises happen, right? So um, you have a series of bad news, you have people that are very worried. And when people are very worried, they extrapolate the recent bad news basically forever into the future. Um, and they then discount the stocks that they own as though the current negative economic scenario were to continue forever. Um, so we're just naturally trend extrapolating. And so what you see then is that especially, you know, cyclical stocks, small cap stocks, industrials, consumer discretionary, things like that, um, oil, uh, energy stocks, uh, is that um, as the revenue and revenues come down five or 10, profits come down 30 and stock price goes down 60. Um, and at that point, right, these stocks are really, really cheap, but they're really cheap because people think revenues are going to go down another 10 and profits are going to go down. Uh, but what typically happens is that the global economy is resilient. And so what happens is that next year or two years from now, revenues are actually up 10, profits are up 50, uh, and the stock is up uh, 80 or 100, right? That's this sort of typical pattern. Um, and so if you are able to say, if you are, first of all, able to have cash when their crisis comes, uh, and second, you're going to say, hey, um, you know what? I'm not going to base my predictions on the market about trend extrapolating what's happened over the past year or thinking about what just hurt markets is going to continue hurting markets forever, but instead are able to step back and say, hey, we're in a crisis. All crises look kind of the same where there's some horrifying thing everyone's scared about. Everyone sells everything. Um, I can go and buy the things that people are most pessimistic about. And when the economy recovers, which it will, um, it always does, um, I will own things that are going to rebound much more significantly um, mm -hmm. than those other safe haven assets, right? Um, so you think of like in COVID, right? Um, you, you wanted to go and buy things that were going to have very sharp rebounds um, uh, rather than I think the sort of human instinct, right? Is that, you know, April, May of 2020 to go buy shares in Zoom or beneficiaries, the things that are currently okay. Um, but where you really make money is buying the things that are the most contrarian in times of crisis. Uh, I think um, so. The, the the viewpoint clearly is don't go to Amazon and Microsoft when um, when you're hitting a crisis. I think uh, that's an interesting, very clearly an interesting point of view. Um, you know, as, as far as that point is concerned. Uh, a quick question about you know how do you sort of approach a crisis? So clearly um, there are indicators that are saying that you know uh, there is something that's going to come. There's a squall that's coming. Uh, how do you think about a portfolio approach in this? See, basically the moment you exit anything and you sort of sit in cash, which is what uh, 
ought to be the logical. So you keep as much cash as possible for you to invest after the crisis is over. But that cash is not doing anything for you. And in today's environment where we are in negative interest rate yield up regimes uh, with, um, you know, 10 years at 3.5 and inflation at 6 and 7, you know, obviously cash is going to lose money for you as well. So what would be the, you know, the approach for the portfolio? You've got a 50 million, 100 million dollar portfolio. What would you be doing before the crisis? As, as you know, it's going to sort of come and hit. Do you sort of get light on some of these assets? How do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think that um, the only real answer is treasuries, um, longer term treasuries. And I think what made last year so unsettling or difficult is that high inflation just whacked treasuries so badly that everybody is that saying, I don't want to put money in treasuries. I'm going to get my, you know, I'm going to get slaughtered again like last year. They're not actually safe. Um, and I think what at least we we're trying to show in our slides is that the stock bond correlation is actually, you know, meaningfully come down. And so as long as inflation doesn't go up again, um, treasuries are probably the right safe haven asset at the moment. Um, uh, gold and oil are, are not necessarily a safe. I mean, oil is really going to get whacked if we enter a crisis. Gold might be okay. Um, uh, and I think stock within stocks, um, you know, the riskier edge of stocks, small cap, emerging market stocks, things like that are, are really at risk. Um, I think one sort of safer place to think about is your, your sort of large, safe multinationals, which again, I think are uh, tend to be more, uh, more resilient. Um, so I think, you know, look, I think there are different types of ways to think, right? Some people just say, hey, I'm going to pick my asset allocation and buy and hold it forever. And if that's your approach, then don't do anything about uh, what's going on now. And I think other folks say, maybe that's half my portfolio or some large percentage, but, but with another percentage, I want to be more tactical and I want to try to make decisions that are in response to what we're seeing. And I think for those people, I'd say, um, at least right now, um, you know, all the signs are, are very scary uh, because banking issues in the banking system and the lending system are the most scary things um, because those affect everyone because we live in a credit-driven world. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if those problems persist or get worse, um, things are going to get much worse fast. Got it, got it. Uh, one quick question on the emerging markets. So you mentioned emerging markets briefly. Uh, obviously, the high yield spread is something that works in mature markets like, um, let's say, the US or Europe, perhaps, and maybe Japan. What would be the yardstick for the emerging market for you to sort of say, this is the time that, you know, you can sort of put in your dips and sort of get into the equities, as it were, you know, when do you yeah. know that the, the peak of the crisis is hit and when the crisis yeah. is bottomed out? Yeah, so we, we, we think of, I mean, I when we think of emerging markets, a lot of the capital for emerging markets is coming externally, right? It's coming from the United States. And so a lot of United States-based economic metrics actually work to predict emerging market outcomes because the dollar flow, that's where the dollar flows are coming from. Now, the, the best time to buy emerging market stocks um, is when two conditions are met. Condition one is that U.S. markets are down a lot. Um, we'd say 20% or more, right? So U.S. investors are suffering um, and where there are multiple emerging markets that are down 50% or more. Um, so we, we often think about emerging markets as sort of a high beta play. They're high beta to U.S. equities. Um, and we think of there being, you know, two reasons that people would sell emerging an emerging market, uh, you know, economy, right? One, which is the reason that you'd want to be a buyer, is, oh my God, my US stocks are getting hammered. Why did I go and buy those stocks in Thailand? I've, I don't know anything about them. They're down 50%. Let's just liquidate that, and, you know, move the money back. And I should just give up on that stupid idea I had when times are good. And those times, right, when the sort of stars align and everybody's just panicked about emerging markets because they're panicked about the US. And so they're selling the least liquid stuff the most is a really good time to be a buyer of emerging market assets. Um, there's another type of scenario where um, the uh, crisis are specific to the emerging market. So, um, you know, the, the president decides to suspend elections and, you know, fire the central bank and the stock market's down 50%. That's not necessarily a good time to go buy the stock market because 
uh, you know, um, whereas India or China might be, you know, relatively stable, you know, some of these smaller markets, you know, you, you have one, you know, person who overthrows the entire system and stocks might never recover. And so your risks are just too great there. Um, but I think in um, environments potentially like what we're about to see where U.S. markets are under pressure and as a result, emerging markets are suffering um, can be really, really great buying opportunities. Fabulous. Okay. Um, the the next question really has to do with um, India itself specifically. I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit, um, Dan. Um, one of the interesting points has been that um, you know uh, India doesn't seem to have sort of um, had the kind of drawdowns that one would expect. You know, the the, the Western world went through a 20 25 percent drawdown in 2022. Um, you know, uh, and uh, many emerging markets sort of fell. You know, all around us there are crises in every geography. You look at Sri Lanka, you look at Pakistan, you look at Bangladesh, um, you look at China. Right? A lot of countries are sort of not doing fabulously well. In this environment, India seems to have held up reasonably okay, right? And um, the, the most recent thing that happened was the uh, Hindenburg um, uh, reveals on uh, Adani, right? Which, if it had happened about um, 10 years ago, would have resulted in a 40-50% crash in the entire market per se, right? So, I um, mean, the market sort of seems to have shrugged it off. You know, these, these stocks are now back to doing what they were doing pre um, the revelations almost as it were. What do you, what do you ascribe to this? What do you, you know, do you have a, do you have a sense of what's been happening here? Yeah, you know, I think they're, you know, I'm, I, you, you all are probably much, obviously, uh, be, be better experts in this than I am. But from, a, you know, uh, the, the view of where I sit, I think there are a few dynamics that have benefited India. Uh, I think one is, um, you know, sort of the conventional wisdom five years ago was that China was extremely well run and well organized and India was messy. Um, and, uh, you know, whether that was corruption or fraud, you know, people were, you know, I, I think regarded investing in China as safe because they thought that the Chinese leadership was brilliant and they were going to ensure and, and India was just hard to understand and, and messy. And I think what we saw in COVID is that uh, the Chinese leadership weren't as smart as they thought they were. And in fact, you know, they did something colossally stupid with this zero COVID thing. And, um, and you know, who knows if they're gonna go to war with Taiwan. And so all of a sudden that looks a lot worse and the messiness of India actually looks a lot more resilient um, and sensible and, and better run. And so I think people are reevaluating the relative um, attractiveness of different economic and political models. Um, I think the second thing is that India, I think, benefited from some of the COVID trends, right? I mean, uh, uh, people becoming more comfortable with remote work or uh, with uh, tech technology, I think, has led people to say, well, if I can have half my workforce work from home in the United States, why couldn't I have half my workforce in India? Um, and I think that's been a beneficiary for, for a lot of Indian companies. Uh, as a result, Indian companies, you know, trade at relatively rich prices for emerging markets, right? It, it's not a cheap market um, in the context of, of EM. Um, it's hard to find real value stocks. It's it's much more sort of a premium emerging market at the moment, uh, which I think has been a good thing. Uh, uh, obviously reflects success uh, over the past a few years on a relative basis. Um, and I think, you know, the, the Adani thing, I think it's a sign that people... Um, uh, I think that people see, um, understand the heterogeneity there. Yes, there are bad things that happen and good things that happen, but it's not like the entire country you um, uh, paint with a broad brush because there was, you know, one bad actor, a potential bad actor. Got it. A couple of questions from the audience, um, you know, Dan. One is really, what is your viewpoint on the metals? I mean, uh, clearly uh, one of the established wisdom is basically when you're going into hard times, you generally go towards the, you know, the, the hard assets as it were. So, you know, whether it be metals or land or, you know, those kinds of things, right? You know, but do you have a point of view or a thought process on, you know, you know, asset allocation around uh, those, uh, those ecosystems, other asset classes beyond equity? Yeah, I think, I think gold, um, gold has a place in people's portfolio. I think gold is an interesting asset. Um, I think, um, especially, you know, recently when you have high inflation and low economic growth and a lot of uncertainty around that, gold can do um, really well. Um, I think the caution for trading gold is that gold's really heavily mean reverting. Um, and so when gold's been doing well, it often comes back down or when it's been doing badly, it comes back up. Um, it's a stable store of value. So that sort of makes sense. 
Um, but it can be a frustrating thing to trade because a lot of people send a pile into it when it's been doing well, and then they lose money. And, and you know, so I think having it as a part of your asset allocation mix and understanding it has that, um, I think if the world collapses, your gold is gonna be your safest investment. Um, uh, but if the world doesn't collapse and you didn't sell your gold when everybody thought the world was going to collapse, you know, you might lose money. So it's it's a, a tricky asset to trade, but it can be very helpful. And it certainly has some really nice portfolio diversification benefits. Um, you know, the other metals like copper and things like that are, are really hard to know how to trade. There aren't clear signals um, and often they trade too correlated to equity markets to be that helpful. Got it. And what about real estate? I think one of the interesting things that's happening in the U.S. right now is that there is a clear, uh, you know, move down in the uh, in the home sales and secondary and primary as well. Uh, what about real estate as a as a class during these times crisis? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think about real estate, and I think the right way to think about real estate is that um, real estate is a type of equity. Um, and what type of equity is it? Well, it's a small. Uh, and levered type of equity. Um, and so it's not a safe haven. Um, it's very risky. Um, it can be, and it trades like small cap equities. Um, and so I think people, um, especially people that own private real estate, they fall for the same trick that people that invest in private equity fall for, which is thinking just because I don't see the value that there hasn't been a change in value. Uh, whereas I think if you look at these assets listed markets, you see uh, quite a lot of volatility. Um, so now over long periods of time, real estate returns look like stock returns, um, right? So it's a good place to invest. It's a good place to have money. Um, but I think people need to not think of it as distinct from equities or not being a risk asset, um, which it very much is, um, even if you don't necessarily see it that way. Got it. Got it. Um, Dan, you're a history buff. Um, you've written a bestseller on um, on an 18 incident. Uh, what is your sense of where we are from an economic perspective? You know, which is the nearest period that um, this period is sort of mirroring, right? Uh, the 1917s, the 1920s, the 1930s, the post-war, you know, the 1970s. Or, you know, you pick, you know, you got the last uh, 100 years, but you might want to go perhaps a little bit more back in time. So if you were to sort of, um, you know, history has a way to teach you things, you know, what would be your message there from a perspective of what we should be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, I think the return of inflation um, certainly brings to mind the 70s. Um, and in the sense that, you know, one of the things, if you look at what happened, and I think all the Fed, people, the Fed are studying the 70s too. It's such an important case study because what happened is that, you know, inflation went up, the Fed raised rates, markets would crash, um, the Fed would stop raising rates, inflation would come back. And so you had that sort of cycle repeat itself multiple times. And the Fed just kept cutting too early and not really squashing inflation. And they paid for that with sort of a decade of this hyper cyclical boom and bust type stuff. Um, and I think you get to sort of the 80s. Uh, and Volcker and, and and the strategy there was just when you just need to break inflation, you know, forever and and sort of markets be damned. Um, and I think probably the Powell is in that camp as a result of studying the 70s. So I think it's important to have that historical analogy in mind. Um, I think in another in another uh, uh, sort of more thinking about the current crisis, I do worry that we're in something like you know, a savings and loan type crisis where there's been a massive expansion in certain types of lending and that we're gonna see, you know, the, the you know, people pay the piper for that massive expansion in lending. And so I think, you know, following what's going on in credit markets, looking at what's going on in private credit, looking at what's happening at these banks, um, trying to understand um, those dynamics is gonna be really important because I think it's gonna drive markets. Got it. Uh, would, would you think that the bullishness of the Fed is likely to hold, you know, the SVB crisis has clearly brought out uh, some kind of uh, liquidity event already, right? You know, the Fed uh, put, has sort of in some sense has been activated because they've come and backstopped a lot of the stupid decision making that uh, some of these banks might have gone through. And in um, in the process, released a ton of money into the economy, which uh, which means which needs more printing, as it were. You know, they're going to make every depositor whole again, where there are holes in the uh, in the ecosystem per se. Uh, 
you know, how, how is that going to work without somebody printing money? And that's going to be uh, the Fed per se, or, uh, you know, the, the bank, right? So doesn't that mean basically that this uh, cycle of tightening could potentially be at an end because you can't have both of these happening, right? That happened in the UK and uh, they lost a prime minister because of that, right? So what is what are your sense of where we are? It's a really tricky situation, right? I mean, I think that they're balancing how much pain can they inflict on markets um, with um, how much pain they can, with, with their clear desire to end inflation and inflation is still too high. And I think that they're gonna make the judgment that um, more pain is okay. Um, uh, I, I fear that that's going to be the solution and that they won't stop right again they won't stop raising until things get really bad um, and I think you know you look at some of the metrics that they might look at and say you know how's Bitcoin doing or something like that and as long as things like that are doing okay I think they might say there's too much speculative money in the economy um, uh, and look at unemployment right employment is all time lows, and that's obviously the most important thing they care about. So, um, if markets crash, and obviously unemployment will go up, but right now employment is so strong, I think it's going to empower them to continue uh, continue raising, although probably more slowly than they have been. Just curious, though, the the bailout of both the banks, Silicon Valley and the the, the other one, Silver Line. Uh, isn't that sort of um, a relaxation of the hawkish attitude in some senses? I mean, if yeah, if, uh, if, yeah, uh, and I think was it's... to say I'm hawkish, then um, doesn't that seem to be like sort of you know not sort of in line with the big picture per se? Yeah. No, I, I think that's right. I think what they're trying to do it's like whack them all, right? It's you know big picture they need to raise rates to keep inflation down, um, and then they just want to you know if there are negative consequences to that that pop up in certain places, they want to solve those on an idiosyncratic basis. I think that's what they're going to try to do. Um, whether it works, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, what would be your ideal portfolio right now, Dan? Um, uh, it sounds like it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be lots of treasuries uh, that you should sort of try and keep, uh, and then you know, sort of wait for the uh, the big event to unfurl, and then you sort of jump in with both your feet into the equivalent of uh, high beta stocks, right? So does that seem to be the kind of thing that you would do right now? Yeah, a lot of a lot of fixed income. Um, well, I'd say a lot of fixed income, and then. Um, owning large safe stocks. Um, I think those feel like the right trades right now um, and probably being de-risked or de-levered relative to where one normally would be. Uh, and if you are able to short, being short oil. Okay, all right. Um, if uh, um, the, the la, sort of the last question here per se, um, the moral hazard of uh, what has happened in the last uh, couple of weeks or so, the, the world is ignored right now to the possibility that um, the Fed is going to backstop uh, their risk taking, in some sense, of the Fed puts per se. And that has played out again this time around uh, with uh, what has happened in the last, uh, you know, last week or so, right? Um, are these bailouts by the governments generally, uh, you, know, uh, you know, they seem to be sort of pushing the market towards increased risk taking and hence increased possibility that something could break, right? You know, whether because of inflation or something else like that. What is your point of view on that? I thought, um, you know, the, the learning was perhaps consistent and that's the reason why fed uh, did uh, whatever you know uh, 50 uh, 50 um, x uh, growth in uh, rates over the last one year but um, you know uh, it seems to me that uh, all that learnings are not uh, on board as yet would you agree yeah what do you think about the moral hazard i think it's there's this sort of schizophrenia in markets right that um the fed i think doesn't like right where they um you know they bail out a bank and normally you'd say gee you know, the fact they needed to bail out a bank is terrifying. And then the NASDAQ rallies, right? Because people say it's risk on, you know, the Fed's you know, going to ease. And I think they must be hating that. And so they're clearly creating some level of moral hazard or excessive risk taking. And it's directly against what they're trying to achieve. Um, and so I think they're really trying to wrestle with that. There's no easy answers. Well, um, I think we're going to continue to keep uh, watch on this space, Dan, and uh, we want to get you back again when uh, when you think um, you know the six hundred basis there is a crisis. number has been met, <laughs> right? So uh, you know, absolutely, and um, we look forward to welcoming you into India. Um, I, I don't think you have a big operation in India at this point in time, so if you are, then we want to invite you. Obviously, we'd love to have you here. Right? Uh, Thank you, Rajiv. Well, I really enjoyed doing this. Thank you so much for having me on.
Thank you so much. Look forward to further such conversations and appreciate your coming on board, Dan. Thank you. Have a good Me day. Me too. Bye. Cheers.